Um, uh, our speaker today is Tom Zedestrom. He's a native of Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, he's a devotee of trees and of forests. He's a famous photographer of trees. Um, he's the recipient of the 2011 Arbor Day Foundation's Public Awareness of Trees Award. And in 2013, he was awarded the Connecticut Urban Forest Council Ossenbergen Award for efforts to educate and promote positive change regarding trees and plants. And that's what he's going to tell us about today. Please welcome Tom Zetterstein. For a, uh, is that lighting okay, Victor? It's, it's okay. Yeah. I can see it. Richard Griggs, a descendant of one of the early Scovilles and Cornwall resident, is our videographer today, and we welcome the press, Ruth Epstein from the Republican, uh, and then we have at least two, three commissioners of the River Commission. Anybody else? And uh, then we have. The founding director of the Berkshire Litchfield Environmental Council, Bill Morrill. <laughs> and uh, then we have the uh, representative of this Salisbury Swallow Work SWAT team. And we're hoping to leave this room today with the establishment of the Japanese not weed SWAT team. Um, we're going to try to cover quite a bit of territory. When I gave this a, a version of this talk at the Cornwall Library, uh, two weeks ago, uh, it was called Three Greeny Aliens, and um, uh, we were looking at a shrub, a vine, and an herbaceous invasive. Today we're going to focus on um, the herbaceous Japanese knotweed, but we'll give a tip of the hat to the two woody plants as well. Um, my, as George was saying, I've been involved with tree protection issues from the early 70s in terms of environmental law, uh, in terms of roadside uh, protection of the, of the uh, cane and champion sycamore from the DOT, which still survives, and um, to even to meddling with the uh, Twin Oaks uh, efforts in the early 90s, to the protection of the premier uh, Egremont uh, Baldwin Hill Elm and the formation of Elm Watch, which overlapped with my photographic endeavors and portraits of the trees. An example of which is a photograph I took 40 years ago of uh, magnificent shagbar hickories, which if you return today, you would need to have your chainsaw, brush blade, or machete. You would be encumbered by woody shrubs going in and knotweed working up from the confluence with the Hollenbeck and probably vines crawling to the top. So just in that period of my recent half century, uh, the visible changes are dramatic. The ecological impact is profound. Uh, even in our studies on working with the USDA Forest Service and the Nature Conservancy uh, with the issue of Dutch elm disease were confronted by these crawling vines. The example in Sharon at the Mary Moore Preserve was that in the nick of time, we protected, identified and protected Connecticut's champion Chinkapin Oak, 48 inches in diameter, that was about to be snuffed out at the upper crown by you know, 10 vines. Those were, those were cut and treated. We used the chemical herbicide called glyphosate in its concentrated form. And we can talk a little bit more about that going forward. Cut and treat is the method we use. If that stem of an invasive was not treated, it would simply re-sprout, as was evidenced from Roger Liddell, Sharon Land Trust's experience. One vine becomes five, five vines become 57, and we have photographs that document this. Um, each of you have in your seat the Connecticut uh, Conservation Commission brochure, which describes in its expanded edition 18 invasive. You probably have six or ten of them in your own backyard. Um, and in that booklet, it describes the 
nature of the plant, identification, mechanical and chemical control, since we're going to be talking about both mechanical and chemical, um, we are understanding that we are not talking about the gross misuse of herbicides, as was displayed by the Bustonic River uh, Valley um, Railroad Company uh, two years ago in Cornwall. And I wish to remind you that, according to Tony Peel's, if you were rebuttal, uh, to be perfectly clear, we are not talking about the careful, responsible, safe, and effective application of glyphosate by Tom Zetterstrom and others to fight invasive plants threatening our native species. Tony Peel happens to be the most vocal opponent as a former director of the World Health Organization of the use of glyphosate. However, he does understand the cost-benefit ratio of the battle that we're engaged in. Um, ever so quickly to discuss a woody shrub, Japanese knotweed. It's growing at the far corner of the library grounds uh, and the work of the Kinetic Ag Experimental Station under one of our science advisors, Dr. Uh, Jeff Ward, 12 times more ticks in the knotweed infested understory of a forest. Barberry, thank you. Barberry, misspoken. Appreciate it. Stay on top of me, please, and, and don't hesitate to interrupt. Okay, so Norfolk Land Trust director hand pulled her section of that forest and it restored like this. That is a remarkable achievement. It took her hundreds of hours, but she enjoyed the work. Um, during that process, it would be recommended that she had plenty of deton, that she had her pants tucked into her socks, and uh, so forth, and did a thorough tick check, which is uh, why Bill Morrill is here, because he's done a thorough tick check for the last 15, 20 years, and has recorded each of those ticks in a log annually, and as he controlled invasives progressively, the tick incidences declined. And um, you can ask for verification from Bill. Um, in the Scoville Sanctuary, Todd Mervosh, who was here, uh, did the treatment of Barberry on the side of the uh, trail that Salisbury School <coughs> running team practices on. And there they were just passing by these things way precariously close. And because of Todd's use of the backpack sprayer and targeting around the invasive plant and avoiding the native plant, he was able to achieve that effect. Um, not we, back, barberry can be controlled by this two step. When we do cut and treat, we're, we're cut, whoops. We're cutting and treating in rapid succession. This would be called the two phase step, cut the stem and treat the, the base. Um, such as this. That's the toolkit that's useful, eye protection is good. Uh, deep should be included in there. Switching to not read. Welcome to the Scoville Library. Um, the weed that took over the world was the uh, title that uh, Lawrence Davis Hollander, the program manager here, uh, latched onto immediately. The part of the world that concerns us is the wild and scenic Cusatonic about to be designated, we hope soon, and the commissioner of the uh, chairman of the River Commission, Bill Tingley, is here. This HVA map shows protected lands. Those lands are protected from development. They are, however, not protected from not weed or necessarily invasives, although Sharon Land Trust has turned a corner with their board to enhance stewardship. Uh, because, quite honestly, protected land without stewardship is a declining property value. The character of the Housatonic River as wild and scenic, and that would be a, an appropriate designation at this point, has a lot of other things that need protection. It's cultural assets, it's recreational assets, it's aquatic uh, health, and campgrounds and hiking trails and Appalachian Trail. It's a uh, remarkable uh, area that would be considered a designation for people all around the Northeast. <coughs> the 
alteration of the riparian area of the Housatonic River with Japanese knotweed, as is the case just north eight miles into Great Barrington, Sheffield area, is a major ecological impact. On the Deerfield River in uh, northern Berkshire County, you can see that that plant knows no limits in terms of its appetite. Uh, scouring and relocating of root fragments brings that down, but also the rhizomes can extend out 65 feet in both directions from a plant, such as this. <laughs> Even in the understory of woodlands and on what's not really agricultural land, but just rocky uh, acid soils. Um, within our watershed, and really this is uh, the zone of concentration for us, we launched a not we network paddlers excursion over the 42 miles of that river. Both banks, teams went down in each town to monitor uh, and um, their names maybe are worth mentioning, but there they are uh, on uh, in print. Uh, we started at the um, Bartholomew's Cobble, and here, with Canaan Mountain in the background, we see the landscape as it existed in my youth, unaltered essentially by any visible evidence. There might be some garlic mustard scattered in some place, and we know there's some vines crawling around in the back there, but essentially, compared to that Deerfield River example, um, pure and clean and native. So uh, monitoring and taking photographs with um, GPS indicators, we were able to create this map. Um, the Hussonic Valley Association Mapping Department, Stacy Deming uh, was responsible for that. And in the the trouble with these damn screens is you can't use a pointer anymore with, you know, of this type. Um, but in Canaan, we found a congestion around the confluence. In Canaan, because we've been on top of our knotweed for some time, we've already treated these sites, these sites, um, and uh, several of these sites, um, and uh, the, the over in Salisbury, those have been treated by Christian Allen. Um, but essentially, this is the, the Housatonic we're attempting to preserve as scenic, part of the wild and scenic. Um, as we approach the covered bridge, we anticipated this because it's hard for anybody with uh, any vegetation on cue to not be aware that there is a cancer on the landscape here. Um, that became, that was documented right here, and there's the covered bridge. And further down south into the Kent area, where the waters flow a little more slowly, you're seeing some more accumulation of knotweed. But Michael Benjamin, the steward manager for the Kent Land Trust, is on top of that, has treated four already. The DEEP is expecting to treat uh, one of the wildlife management areas there later this summer. Uh, and then down into New Milford, um, the Antonov Land Trust is on top of one of their sites. But hey, in each section, uh, there's monitoring and treatment that needs to occur. Thank you, HVA and Lynn Warner, for their cooperation. Back to the Cornwall Covered Bridge and what is the Sharon side of the river, previous to our excursion, uh, that area was pretty well clarified in our minds, and uh, Bob Gambino of uh, New Milford, who was also a river commissioner, and Christian Allen are assessing the challenge. Um, that was treated in September 29th of 2018. It was a, a 2017, <coughs> and this was the effect. Here along the river, the application was made from standing on these rocks. That was a very dry drought year, so we had uh, less contact with water. Not a drop of glyphosate mixture fell into the river. That was a still sunny day. It was applied to a canopy 
of the plants. And on the back side, we used an orchard ladder so we could apply down and we can see where that chemistry is going. Um, in this case, the reach of the spray of the pump was only so far and, and therefore required a second application and that occurred last September and that's Bob Gambino doing uh, that which should resolve that issue. Here on year two, we barely used five or three percent of the initial application of some spot treatments only. Um, and I suspect that that section is going to be resolved this year. Notice the proximity to this area here. When we pulled out of, uh, with Eugene Warner and I right down here, wow, a little, not we plant, about that big. And then a closer examination, we noticed there's about six of them in River Park. That's the first one we saw. That's the second one. That's about nine stems. That could be treated with probably a quart of glyphosate mixture or could be stem injected with a matter of milliliters per stem. What we were hoping to do is prevent in West Cornwall, what happened in Sheffield, where the transformation of the, what you would like to think of as the scene of Cousatonic in Berkshire County, became an oriental landscape. And looking upstream, standing at the foot of the bridge, uh, just uh, extraordinary uh, impact. Crossing the river, and then crossing the river up here, um, as there is no management there, one can only expect uh, it will continue. Actually, there's not weed back there as well. Um, it's quite possible in my mind to think that when that bridge was reconstructed following the fire, that fill around its base could have introduced not weed fragments of roots. And we'll talk about that as we get into management. But imagine that scenario extending out into this iconic landscape and architecture and altering it if there is a hands-off, laissez-faire approach to invasive management. Here at the park, you can see ah, how nicely it blends in to the uh, native vegetation until it establishes its roots and then starts, gets to the point where even by April 27th, it's able to pump out more nearly a three-foot plant. Um, citizens of Cornwall went in there and extracted, hand dug, and tarped the areas of knotweed because they preferred not to use herbicide there. This is a reasonable management strategy in this early detection situation. Uh, it means you have what would be considered controlled waste in England. Um, it's got to go to the proper disposal. You don't want to put it in your compost. But that, that nine stem plant grew here. And you can see some of the fragments were kind of left there to hold the tarp in place, which would not be the uh, prescribed method. Um, so the, in addition, this tarping needs to be maintained for a period of four to five years in order to be assured that the root is dead, completely dead. Um, any hint of life remaining in that root will reinvigorate the new plant that will emerge from it. Across the river, just last Monday, Earth Day, um, our Gingert and I um, sowed this area and we tried four different seed mixes going down along the river and this is only 19 months after the initial treatment and we were pleased to see the skunk cabbage return which my suspicion is the canopy of knotweed foliage received the herbicide any knotweed that might have been struggling down in the darkness of its canopy beneath 
was unaffected by the glyphosate treatment. And that's a, a pretty interesting transition back to native plant right there. You can see it extending quite far up into this area. At the covered bridge, the two examples of management are evident. Go to where we just came from. On the newly established first occurrences, scattered locations, early recognition. Fortunately, we spotted it in 2018. Cost of control, minimal. Okay, a couple of pieces of plastic and some labor. Public starts to become aware, pretty late in the game. Across the river, you know, I'm not sure other than uh, people such as Bob Gambino and myself uh, and Christian Allen and invasive plant managers would wonder what is going on behind the West Cornwall Garage. But <laughs> by the time we got there and Bob Gambino led that assault as the most experienced invasive plant manager in Richfield County, I might add. And uh, it is good of, that we have him on the River Commission. But the costs would have been up here, except he's doing it pro bono as a demonstration that it can be done and that is setting forth a, a model of achievement for the wild and scenic Housatonic. In Great Barrington, as an example of smothering, it's called, not we had traveled all the way up from the Housatonic beyond that house and across the road. And, uh, Kathy uh, Kessler uh, and her husband are managing it this way. Um, <coughs> The Houston Valley Association has several projects where they're managing knotweed on the Still River, and that is further south, about 30, 40 miles from here. Um, and that's quite an extensive uh, effort of uh, tarping and um, can be effective if it's maintained for five years. And, uh, but things like uh, knotweed that might be stretching out beyond the tarp are going to help sustain life in that extensive rhizome network. We got to realize that the above ground portion of the plant is one third of the biomass of the plant. Two thirds of the biomass of the plant is the rhizome root system. And that is the extraordinary power of the plant to survive and replicate. So those tarping systems are involved with containment, whereas down in Cornwall, we're aiming for eradication around the covered bridge entirely. The, the ratio of effort to benefit is so much greater in that early period of identification and re response. At Cornwall Covered Bridge, one site was overlooked, and I came in there aware of it, thinking, okay, I'll just spray this with uh, what would have been three ounces of mixed 1% glyphosate. Someone had hit it with a weed whacker and just left it there hours before I arrived. I gathered up that material because I knew it was uh, a pile of propagules of knotweed. And if it got blown by the wind or distributed or kicked around or tossed out of the way, every fragment here can regenerate even something as small as this. And it said, even something as small as a half an inch. There's a nodule there in the right setting that will put out rhizomes and establish itself. And oh, you know, you'll notice it five years later, perhaps. I dug these up at the uh, Connecticut DOT garage on uh, Tuesday. And um, they were growing in one of their gravel pits. And I said, hey, can we get the payloader and put a couple of forks on there and see if we can extract that? Because we don't want that trend distributed around Canaan, that's for sure. Uh, or Salisbury, which that garage serves. And notice, this was, these were not very big stalks. These were just overwintered, so they busted off. But that was a pretty small plant. And yet, look at that root system. And notice, we didn't quite get it out intact. It broke. The root system is brittle almost like a carrot, let's say. And, it, and that is the primary method of redistribution and expansion of this plant. Here's a, a slightly bigger plant, but you can see that's a pretty healthy tuber going down. Those roots can descend five, ten feet, excuse me, into the ground. 
uh, and can extend out 65 feet laterally. So back to recreation. Now we remember, this guy is fishing in the uh, Housatonic, and just upstream off his right shoulder is the mother load of knotweed, and just over to the left are these young plants, and these are being resolved. Had they not been resolved, and do, and if we don't resolve them, and understand the difference between native plant communities and what are called novel communities, these are invasives, um, we're going to lose trout fisheries in our area. I, um, two years ago, next month, we hosted uh, with the Salisbury Forum, Dr. Doug Talmay, chief entomologist of the University of Delaware, bringing nature home, advocate for the um, interaction between native plants and native insects, native birds, and the entire food web, which is what the, our biosphere originally was designed to support. 10x fewer insect interactions in the knotweed stands of hedgerows versus native plants. So I said, Doug, uh, could we transfer that hedgerow concept of vegetative comparison to riparian strips? And he said, that's not a bad idea. And um, in the hedgerow setting, we're talking about the dynamic of the food web as it affects birds and other animals. In the riparian setting, we're talking about birds, certainly, but also fish, falling input. Uh, invertebrate prey inputs have direct and indirect effects on stream and riparian food webs. This is so, so Doug Tallamy said, okay, I'll put my administrative assistant on here. Uh, and she came up with these. These invertebrates provide up to half of the energy uh, budget of salmonids. That's trout, by the way, or salmon, if you will, despite the fact that the infant oil occurs principally in the summer. So our riparian edges are more than a visual insult. They actually have a direct ecological impact. Doug Talame was kind enough to design for us an experiment to compare vegetation and riparian areas, um, such as this side of the Hoosier <laughs> versus that side. This is what Doug Ptolemy would call an insect desert. There might be some Japanese beetles in there, but uh, not much else. Um, on the survey of the tributary of the Housatonic called the Blackberry River in Canaan, um, we found um, a dominance, uh, actually a monoculture of Japanese knotweed such as uh, for what would be perhaps otherwise in a natural setting, uh, a good trout fishing stream. This is not enough shade, not enough insects, um, and uh, probably not enough uh, carving and pools. Maybe we will be able to set up an experiment that compares that section to maybe a section like this of the Concapot River, which also flows through Canaan, and one a mile section um, and see what we come up with. So we have begun a dialogue with the University of Massachusetts uh, entomologist and Williams College of Center for Environmental Studies and they seem quite interested and hopefully we can find a student this summer to set up these flow traps in the river in different sections that are one foot below and one foot above and they're anchored in there with weights, and they're just catching drift insects. Then those go to the um, lab for analysis. So that's our strategy going forward, to really get a better handle on um, the full implications of this plant in the wild and scenic peace line. How to identify it, now that you know it's not such a cool plant. Um, this is what it looks like in January, uh, going on south of uh, 272 in Norfolk. 
This is what it looks like uh, around uh, mid-April at the state capitol as I came out of a meeting with the Environment Committee two years ago. Uh, this is what it looks like behind Visionary Computer in mid-May. And here they are. Da, 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 da. Uh, this is what it looks like in early June looking north of the covered bridge in Sheffield. Okay, so it's already gone from like three to five to six. Uh, here is uh, uh, Sharon on Route 41 in uh, uh, early July, it's up to eight feet. Here it is in late July, it's 10 or 12 feet tall. Uh, here it is uh, in, in August. In, uh, da, 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 and here it is in late August. So that's early August versus late. By late August, it's in blossom. This is Cornwall, Route 7, near uh, Stonewall Farm. This had been mowed by DOT. Mowing can be part of a management strategy. What it does is it prevents blossoms. It also can be a disadvantage if you don't clean off your mower and if you're moving proper fuels on the deck of the mower down the road and they're dropping off and you're creating new sites. The blossoms are profuse. Obviously, this is one of the attractions that made it seem like a good idea in 1890 to introduce this plant to North America. Um, the seeds are about a sixteenth of an inch long and these can float downstream to relodge, or they can be windblown across Route 44 to get across the street. Uh, in late August into September, the stalks are turning from a kind of fleshy softness, such as these, to a half woody stem, which is why we see them pre prevail. Okay, so this is a uh, indicates to you, if you don't believe me, that it excludes native vegetation and greatly alters natural ecosystems. poses a significant threat to riparian areas where it can survive severe floods and where it can rapidly colonize scoured shores. Art Jengert and the bird watching community of Cornwall mapped their town and found quite a few knotweed sites coordinated with Steve Geddes, arborist of the Connecticut DOT, and several of those sites have been treated. In Canaan, we have done the same thing, cooperating with the DOT, and we started our early mapping using push pins, very simple matter. And just recently, we have converted to digital, and that was a project that Christian worked on with Victor Flores uh, as one of his high school Yukon CAPS programs. And um, this is a little overstated out here because, huh, unfortunately, some of the site locations where they were taking a reading were along the, river, the road, and those shouldn't have been introduced into the database. But it should be said that in North Canaan, we've already treated the, this area, this, 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 um, and then, let's see, here out in Green Acres, all of these have been treated, plus these right here. Uh, this is interesting in terms of the proximity of Route 44 to the uh, river. Okay, now let's see, I wanted to go, okay, we're going to come back to that issue. Here's uh, my very casual map. <laughs> Had to put something together for Salisbury. Um, this is going to be another task of the Salisbury not read SWAT team, by the way, is to upgrade to digital. Um, this is the outflow of Fisher Pond uh, in Taconic on uh, Dam Road. Prime opportunity to do some hand digging if you want to get into it. Um, by, and that was probably taken last year. By this year, these things are going to be big enough to stem inject um, because it's in proximity to flowing water. It requires a wetlands permit. Lynn, are you on that commission? No. Um, here we see a site that was just behind the parking lot of the White Hart Inn. I suspect seeds might have been blown across that asphalt and lodged in this nice little area here. So that's, um, it's right in the heart of this town of Salisbury. And if you go up to the rail trail and turn right, you'll run into knotweed. Here's, uh, this is where I picked this morning. Uh, this is the little brook right next to the Iron Bank. Of course, that's a tributary of 
the Salmon Kill, which is a tributary of the Housatonic. So, uh, shall we say, it's not as benign as it might appear. Uh, photographed by Chani Wells, one of our famous local Salisbury photographers and, and uh, advocate for knotweed management in the rail trail for years. Hasn't gotten traction on that. Um, if we can form that knotweed SWAT team, and I have people in mind who are sitting right in this room, and uh, Louise Lindenmeyer strikes me as foremost among them, and, and <laughs> Stacy, and uh, who is a river, uh, one of your river commissioners, and, and Chani, and uh, Bill Morrill. I bet you you could shake things up at the uh, house across the street there. Uh, because I honestly recognize not weed, not weed, not weed. Over time, it's going to fill in. It's going to be an alley of knotweed. Um, a world walk in nature it would be a stretch of the imagination. The site that really got us into gear in Canaan was the backyard of Troop B police barracks, a third of which was becoming a knotweed forest. This is where they land helicopters when there's a need to bring a helicopter into town. It probably started around this little riparian pool here. The rail track is behind there. Could have been some fill put in there at some point that was contaminated. This is a huge project, and the state DOT guy has been spraying part of it, but uh, it needs a, a proper management strategy. Here we are doing an example of injecting um, not meat in the sims in a late season. That's very effective. But you can't imagine doing this behind the West Cornwall garage. You would be in there for the rest of your life. <laughs> um, in Canaan, in our early treatment, and this was after mowing, so these plants were low to the ground and there was no blossom. I, as a volunteer, did the spraying with the uh, agreement and cooperation and written permission of the selectmen. Um, and we, with one spraying, we eliminated that knot. We, the nearby neighbor took it over and did a little mowing around the edges, and it's resolved. Um, in another site in Canaan on Daisy Hill, uh, here you see a couple <coughs> of sprouts that emerged. We did some spot spraying, and we're about to do some seeding there. Christian Allen is doing some spraying on the side of uh, uh, DOT 44, where we had marked it for them, please spray, but they didn't. Uh, and what's interesting here in this act of roadside management, at this location, we are preventing not we from crossing that little dirt road and are entering into a vernal pool where it would be very hard and challenging to control. And the knotweed would love it. It would take over in a matter of a year. Here's the DOT garage of Canaan. This is the knotweed we just dug up. And there it is, growing right there, dropping seeds into the gravel. Not a good practice. Here it is in Falls Village, their gravel pit. Same thing going on here. Knotweed and fill. Um, in England, Contaminated fill is control, considered a controlled waste, and uh, you, if you uh, if your waste is responsible for the establishment of those plants, you are responsible for resolving it. Uh, we're looking here at the issue of line of sight. So the over the fence mower comes down, and for a period of time, this site this sign is visible. But you can see after a period of time, it, or shall we say, the day before this happened, it wasn't visible. Um, the problem with that over the fence mower is that a little fragment came up about a mile, in my speculation, up Route 7 and established a new site. We flagged it, saying, please spray, don't blow. Unfortunately, we haven't got that far with our DOT report. This is the wrong kind of mower, but you can see that the point I'm making here is fragment uh, relocation. Um, only down Salmon Kill Road, three quarters of a mile from the library, uh, the town crew really tried to do an excellent job controlling not weed with a mower. However, in this case, backing up that mower right up to the edge of Salmon Kill undoubtedly flung 
possibly hundreds of propagules into the salmon kill, which carry downstream mean that that beautiful valley going behind uh, Whipper Will Farm, really all the way down through Lime Rock and past the race course and all the way to the confluence of the high school, um, probably is a hundredfold at greater risk of new not weed establishments. So the do's and don'ts and protection of the river have a lot to do with what's called the best management practices. Along the Housatonic and Risingdale in Great Barrington, knotweed at this level could be safely sprayed. In their enthusiasm, environmental enthusiasm somewhat misinformed, the state legislature of Massachusetts has prohibited the use of roadside herbicides in all cases. Therefore, roadside management is limited to mechanical. And undoubtedly, that happened here. That mower went in there and spewed stuff into the Housatonic. It's such that my prediction is, within 20 years, this will be lined with knotweed all around here. Best management practices is the subject we've begun with our town crew in Canaan, and just a few days ago with uh, your foreman in Salisbury, uh, Don Reed, and um, he and uh, Webby are going to come to the talk I'm going to give on roadside management at the Co Council of Governments on Tuesday morning. So maybe we will ad advocate for better practices when controlling these weeds. Here we have a wild and scenic Housatonic and the footprint of the Northwest Hills Council of Governments. So we have we're definitely interested in communicating with these seven towns, including New Milford. Okay, we're in the final chapter. The light at the end of the tunnel is a very interesting one, and it may not materialize, but we are hopeful. It is a biological control. There are no biological controls for bittersweet vine or barberry because there are native plants of that type. Japanese knotweed is strictly a non-native plant. The um, USDA Forest Service, Forest Health people are, we're in touch with, and Fritzi Grafstad is leading this effort with uh, the introduction of this insect. This could be our salvation. This is a psyllid, a sucking <coughs> insect, which lays its eggs on knotweed stems and leaves, and when those emerge, those start sucking the sap of the plant and can diminish its vigor <coughs> significantly. Um, this will be, perhaps, if we can maintain reasonable manage going, management going forward for the next one, two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there should be some overlap. As the release of this insect has been permitted by the USDA, though there is a period coming up in May of comments. And this is important, lest I forget. Um, I'm going to start one at the back and one at the front. Uh, please uh, just give me your email address. What you would, what I would like to do, at least from significant people, Tingley, uh, chairman of the Houstonic River Commission, Lynn Warner, HVA, um, other commissioners and town board members offering comment to encourage the proceeding with this test. Um, in my opinion, it should become da -da -da -da, before management becomes hopeless. This should be the campaign for this wild scenic knotweed effort. Um, Last point is the Open Space Institute and other environmental organizations are thinking in terms of climate change and the progression of vegetation that's moving up and new invasives. Uh, and they've come up with what they call the resilient landscape. When I heard this presentation at Great Martin Forest, my question was, what is the impact of invasive plants in the resilient landscape? They had no answer. I can't imagine they hadn't thought of that question. There may not be a good answer 
My interpretation is you take out the cattail and fill that in with Phragmites there, and you fill in knotweed here, and then you strangle a few of these big trees with a bittersweet vine and congest the understory with barberry. You could go on and on and on. You have a novel ecosystem, and it basically pulls a rug out of the native ecosystem. Um, it's a sad story, and quite honestly, having grown up with uh, the, uh, thank you very much, I guess that's the end. Having grown up with the native ecosystem, I, I'm so aware of it. How many people really do understand the, the visual difference between not all green is good, that there are differentiations? Is that pretty clear here? Yeah. Uh, Peter, can you put the lights 